Welcome back everyone to another episode of Space This Week. Every Monday I bring you these videos to keep you in the loop about Starship development, launch news and everything else spaceflight. We have a lot of stuff to talk about today, from the ever busy activities around Starbase, some big breakthroughs on the Chinese space station and the increasingly bad luck for NASA with their Artemis 1 mission. All of this and more in line, let's roll the intro and kick things off with Starship Talk. Static Fire Madness! A couple of weeks ago we were treated to a single Raptor Static Fire of Booster 7, and it didn't explode. After this successful Static Fire, Booster 7 was rolled back to the Mega Bay where the inner 13 Raptor 2s were installed. It was then rolled back out to the launch pad, mounted there using the Mechazilla arms, and SpaceX prepared to fire the beast up once again. And on Wednesday last week, all of this materialised. This was the third static fire for Booster 7 and the very first one to feature multiple Raptor engines. Up until now, it's always been a single engine static fire. Lab Padre's live streams, as always, offered some amazing views of the event. The streams also captured some views of the SpaceX robot dog inspecting the scene shortly after the static fire took place. Look at it go. <laughs> Ryan Hansen offered a bit of analysis of the static fire on Twitter. Give him a follow if you're not already, speculating that one of the engines aborted. Now, unfortunately, there's no official word from SpaceX, so it's hard to say if this static fire was fully successful or not. Unfortunately, things weren't so fly with Ship 24. Towards the end of last week, it was being held by the SpaceX crane while workers busily tended to the vehicle. It was then placed back on the pad and not long after the Booster 7 static fire, SpaceX prepared to conduct a static fire of Ship 24. We saw lots of tanking activities and frost forming on the sides of the vehicle and the SpaceX drone was spotted at the scene. But sadly, the static fire never came and eventually we saw a big depress on the vehicle. Nick Ansuini spotted a Vacuum Raptor 2 on the way to the build site on Saturday. Man, those things are big. I know it's well established that Raptor 2 is much cleaner than Raptor 1, but let's compare the vacuum models. On the right is Raptor 1, and on the left is Raptor 2. Huge difference. Speaking of hugeness, <laughs> in case you're curious as to why the Vacuum Raptor is so big compared to the sea level model, it's because the ambient pressure inside the engine bell ideally needs to be as close to the air pressure around the engine bell as possible. The smaller sea level engine has a small bell so that the pressure is higher inside the bell to match the higher pressures found at sea level, while the Vacuum Raptor has a much bigger engine bell so that the pressure can be as low as possible to match the low pressure of the upper atmosphere and also the zero pressure of the vacuum of space. Could this engine be a replacement for Vacuum Raptor number 65, which was removed from Ship 24 last week? Only time will tell. While we're talking about Raptor 2, Justin Swartz captured this footage of a Raptor 2 on the tripod test stand at the SpaceX Rocket and Development Facility in McGregor, Texas. Three seconds into the burn, the engine was throttled up to full power and held there. And about 40 seconds later, this happened. Oof. We do believe that the purpose of this engine test was a test to failure point, so this isn't really a bad thing, and there was no explosion either, meaning that if a Raptor 2 fails like this during flight, it hopefully won't take out the rest of the engines and cause an N1 style incident. Elon Musk has stated before that loss of a single engine shouldn't theoretically prevent the Super Heavy from reaching space, so whether or not this failure was planned, it looks like it was a success overall. CSI Starbase posted a question to Elon Musk on Twitter asking why the booster quick disconnect on the orbital launch table can't be used to start the central 13 Raptor engines. At present, the inner engines are all spun up via gas stored on the onboard COPV tanks, while the outer 20 engines are supplied by the launch pad itself. It's a good question, as by having the launch pad supply the gas for the inner 13 engines as well as the outer 20 means that the booster only needs to carry enough gas for the boost back burns and landing burns, reducing the mass and therefore increasing payload. Elon replied, confirming that this is indeed being worked on by SpaceX, as well as a number of other upgrades to reduce the odds of rapid unplanned disassembly to protect the booster and the other engines and the launch ring. This probably all sparked from that explosion we saw on the Booster 7 spin prime test a few weeks ago, and I suspect that the test of failure we saw at the SpaceX McGregor facility was in support of this goal. Ryan Hansen shared a cool teaser video of a big project many months in the making which is eventually going to be a 10 plus minute animation of an early test flight of Starship. 
Multiple artists are working on this and I can't wait to see the project unfold. I'll put a link to it in the description if you want to watch. An interesting theory is making the rounds about post-Ship 25 vehicles. We've been getting used to seeing the heat shield cladded Ship 20 and Ship 24 and it looks like Ship 25, which also sports a heat shield, is nearly complete as well. But the Ship 26 nose cone has now had all of its heat shield tiles completely removed and future Starship vehicle segments have skipped the heat shield installation process entirely. The theory is that, if only temporary, SpaceX won't be reusing the Starship upper stage for the initial flights and will only be attempting to recover the Super Heavy booster. This is probably due to both the enormous complexity involved with the reuse of the upper stage and the fact that SpaceX are desperate to get Starlink V2 operational. These satellites are so massive that they can only be launched on Starship. Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy won't cut it. It wasn't that long ago when Elon declared the Starlink program to be in crisis and on the brink of bankrupting SpaceX, and this, coupled with their new deal with T-Mobile, is probably giving SpaceX a big push to just get the Starship flying and focus on reuse of the second stage later. This mirrors their plan with Falcon 9. There was a point in time where SpaceX wanted to work on reusing the Falcon 9 upper stage, but priorities then shifted towards Starship. Now on the subject of Starlink, the Starlink V1s seem to be doing just fine. Last week we saw another Falcon 9 Starlink launch on the 31st of August. The first stage for this flight was Booster 1063 and this was its seventh flight overall. This was another nighttime launch unfortunately, which means you can't really see too much in the B-roll, but hey, we still got some nice uninterrupted footage of the first stage landing on the drone ship Of Course I Still Love You, courtesy of that unbreakable Starlink internet. The 46 Starlink satellites successfully made it to orbit and are now operational, so well done to SpaceX on another successful mission. Unfortunately, the same couldn't be said for Artemis 1. This was supposed to launch on Monday, however, it was unfortunately aborted due to an issue with RS-25 engine number 3 on the core stage. It was rescheduled to Saturday the 3rd of September, but once again the launch was aborted due to a hydrogen leak on an 8-inch diameter fuel line, which carried liquid hydrogen to the rocket. The leak was located at the Quick Disconnect Inlet, which is the point where the fuel line connects to the rocket's core stage. Three attempts were made to fix the leak, but unfortunately all were unsuccessful and the launch was cooled off. On Monday, so today, engineers will be inspecting the vehicle at the pad. We're all hoping that the failed hardware can be repaired at the launch pad, otherwise NASA will need to roll the whole thing back to the vehicle assembly building. Hydrogen is just unfortunately very difficult to work with. It's the lightest of all the elements and therefore the smallest, so it can fit through the tiniest of gaps and is much more prone to leaking. The SLS, for all intents and purposes, is essentially just a rocket cobbled together from space shuttle hardware, which itself is over 40 years old. The shuttle was no stranger to scrubs either. With hydrogen leaks often to blame, on average the shuttle scrubbed once per launch. Eric Berger wrote a brilliant piece for Ars Technica about this latest abort and performs a deeper dive into the difficulties of working with hydrogen and the enormous complexity of fueling up rockets, and I highly recommend checking the article out. Link in the description. And hey, while you're down there, don't forget to like this video if you are enjoying the ride so far, and don't forget to subscribe and ring that bell as well so you get notified of these videos which I post every single Monday so that you stay in the loop with space news. Now, last week wasn't all doom and gloom in the spaceflight industry. China had some big successes. First of all, they performed a successful Yaogan satellite launch aboard a Long March 4C launch vehicle on the 2nd of September. The single Yaogan 3302 satellite successfully entered its planned orbit and official sources state that it'll be used for scientific experiments, land resources surveys, crop yield estimation and disaster prevention. Although it is pretty well suspected that the Yaogan satellites are also used for military reconnaissance given that the program is bankrolled by the Chinese military. <laughs> In more exciting Chinese news, last week we saw the first extravehicular activity of the Shenzhou 14 mission which began on the 1st of September aboard the Chinese Tiangong space station. Commander Chen Dong successfully opened the airlock of the Wentian laboratory module, which he successfully exited alongside fellow crewmate Liu Yang when they began their planned six-hour spacewalk, working on the recently added Wentian laboratory module. The next laboratory module planned for the space station is the Mentian module. Now, this is planned to launch in October on a Long March 5B, and last week, China released footage of the Mentian arriving at the Wenchang spacecraft launch site, ready for final preparations and integration. Mentian means dreaming of heavens, and this launch is going to be an exciting one to watch, so make sure you're subscribed so that you don't miss my coverage of this one. When the Wentian was launched, it carried a few scientific experiments. One of the things it carried were seeds for Arabidopsis and two varieties of rice. The crew of the station installed the plant experiments on the laboratory's life experimental ecology module in late July, and look! The Arabidopsis plants now have leaves, and the rice is growing tall as well. 
The plan is for the plants to complete an entire life cycle from seed to seed, which would be a first for rice in microgravity. Then the samples will be frozen and returned to Earth for analysis. While it was a shame we didn't get to see the SLS launch from the Kennedy Space Center last week, we did get to see it launch from the Kerbal Space Center. The dev team for Kerbal Space Program 2 released a video of an SLS launch in a pre-alpha version of the game. It's obviously a little bit rough around the edges due to the fact that this is still a pre-alpha build, and hopefully a lot of these textures are only placeholder. But hey, it's great seeing updates from the KSP2 dev team, I can't wait to see what they have in store for us. Now big thanks are owed to the names on screen, they're my channel members and Patreon supporters who together all make this content possible. If you want your name to appear on this list then click the links either on screen or in the description, otherwise there are two video suggestions on screen that YouTube thinks you'll like, hopefully they're good picks. Guys, thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in the next one. Don't know if it's going to be Kerbal. I'm working on a Kerbal. It's taken a while. I'm very busy, but I'm trying my best. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>